continue. Yeah. Welcome everyone. Welcome to this our very, very first online live Words with Wine. My name is Tamara and I'm the Library Events Officer here at the City of South Perth Libraries. So to begin with, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, uh, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the, con the contribution that they make to the life of this city. So, having done that welcome, I can now let you know that it has been a very exciting and as I'm sure you can imagine, quite challenging time for libraries. Like so many service providers, we've had to adapt to find new and creative ways to bring what we do into our now socially distanced world. And this is one of those adaptions that we hope that you will enjoy. So before we go any further, I need to do the usual housekeeping. So firstly, to do with the technology that we are all engaging with right now. On the right hand side of your screen, you should see a light coloured column that says live event Q&A. If down the bottom, it will say, you know, ask a question. You'll then be prompted to, answer, uh, to enter in your name and this will be the name that we'll use to address you during our event tonight. So you might just want to use your first name and a, and a last initial so that we can um, identify, say, if we've got a number of Johns or Marys, we can, you can tell whether we're asking your question or not. It would also be um, helpful if you would be asking those questions all the way through the presentation. Ask them as you think them. That gives me a chance to read through them and to organise them because while we're going to be listening to our speaker, I'll be in the background looking at those questions and if a number of you have asked a similar question, then I'll be collating those for our presenter to answer towards the end of our presentation tonight. You can ask questions anonymously if you would like to. There is a little box just underneath where you ask the question. Just click on that to ask a, a question anonymously. Now, at this point, I would usually point out the location of the bathrooms, but I'm sure that you are aware where your own bathroom is at home. So I'm not going to bother trying to tell you to where the bathrooms are, nor am I going to try and tell you where the emergency exits are. It's all the master point. Um, tonight, there will be no crossing of the car park and gathering around the War Memorial. So the system has already sent you an email requesting feedback about tonight's event. So my trigger finger forgot to change the time from a.m. to p.m. So I do apologise if I gave anybody a, a little start. Um, have I missed the event? Because here's the post-event survey. I apologise for that. We don't want to be sort of filling up your inbox. So we won't be sending that again. Um, just use that link after the event to give us some feedback. We strive at City of South Perth Libraries. We work quite hard to give our communities the very best events that we can come up with. And we rely on your feedback for support to help us improve and to make sure that what we're offering is indeed what you are wanting us to offer. So I hope that you are now settled in on your couch and you have poured yourself, I will join you, your glass of wine and you have some cheese or some other nibble of your choice ready to enjoy for me to now introduce tonight's speaker emily paul emily is a writer of short fiction and historical fiction and she's a local she's from perth west australia her work has appeared in journals such as the westerly and anthologies published by margaret river press WA, amongst others. 
Emily Writing has been shortlisted for the John Marsden Hatchet Australia Award for Young Writers and the Haddo Stewart Award. And in 2014, Emily was a young writer in residence at the Catherine Susanna Pritchard Writers' Centre. A former bookseller, and some people who are local may recognise Emily's face, she was twice nominated for the Abia Young Bookseller of the Year Award, and in 2018, she was a guest at the Australian Short Story Festival. So despite her youth, she's actually achieved some amazing things. Then in 2019, Margaret River Press published Emily's debut collection of short stories. And that's what we're about to hear about tonight, Well Behaved Women. I love the title. I can't wait to hear more about it. And so what I'm going to do now is I am going to cross over, cross us all over to Emily and say, welcome, Emily. Thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much, Tamara, and thank you very much to the City of South Perth Libraries for putting on this event. Um, in, in one way, it's kind of great that we've had to shift to this online model because I know that um, from my own personal experience, I often feel very jealous when I see all of these fabulous author talks going on um, in the eastern states that I can't attend because I'm over here and I've been able to tune into a lot of great author talks through various online platforms. So now I'm really excited to be doing one myself. So yes, my name is Emily Paul and I wrote this book here, Well Behaved Women. And when you hear the title, I hope you're completing the quote in your head, Well Behaved Women Seldom Make History, because that's the central theme that ties these 17 short stories together. It's a book about everyday acts of small rebellion, about women who um, don't follow the rules that society sets out for them, but not on a global scale. They're not um, inciting revolution. Maybe they're just refusing to do what's expected of them on a domestic scale, in their own home, in a relationship. Um, Perhaps they're just reacting authentically and allowing themselves to feel those feelings and letting people see a side of them that maybe they're not supposed to because we, we know the traditional narratives of, you know, good girls should be seen and not heard. Um, you should be pretty and not argue. And I really wanted to challenge a lot of that in this book. Um, it presents 17 different views of what it is to be a woman in Australia. Obviously, my own experience is quite limited. I don't know what it is to be anything other than a fairly privileged white woman, um, and I'm not trying to speak to any other experience, but I hope that I've given 17 fairly different portraits um, of 17 quite interesting characters for you to explore. I thought tonight that I would tell you a little bit about the process that I went through to get this book published and my journey to publication. And then if we have time, I'll do a bit of a reading for you before we throw over to the Q&A session that Tamara mentioned earlier. So I like to think of this book as the book that snuck up on me because I've always thought of myself as a novelist uh, first and a short story writer second. So um, for the longest time I'd been working on a historical novel called Between the Sleepers, which is set during the Second World War in Fremantle, and I had gone through 10 or 11 different drafts of that, sent it to competitions, didn't win, sent it to a few agents. Some of them got very close to signing it, but not quite close enough. And in the meantime, in between different drafts of that, I was writing short stories. Um, I've actually written numerous novels since I was a, a teenager, but only one that I think of as being a real novel. I don't know if anyone's ever done NaNoWriMo before, but I went through a phase where I did NaNoWriMo every year. Um, and through that, I've written multiple um, multiple novels. In fact, I think City of South Perth usually does a NaNoWriMo event. I think I've been to a Write Night event at South Perth before. I can see Tamara nodding. You guys probably can't, but I can. So yes, there is a NaNoWriMo event at South Perth. Um, but yes, yeah, so I've written that novel. That's now in a in a drawer, waiting for me to have time to fix it up. Um, and in between the drafts of that, I was writing short stories, and I, I began to fall in love 
with the short story as a form, the more short stories that I read. We have a really rich um, collection of short story writers publishing in Australia today. I think that Australian short story writers really punch above their weight and we've developed our own particular style. Um, the Australian short story generally tends to be about 3000 words in length maximum, and that I think is largely dictated by the limits that we have on a lot of the competitions and publications that we have available to us. So we've sort of trained ourselves to write a, a 3000 word short story, whereas the American iteration of the short story can sometimes tend to be a lot longer than that. And what that means is that you have to be very economical with your word choices. You have to choose exactly the right word, not be repetitive, be very decisive in the ways that you bring character across, um, not have too many characters as well. Um, and if you want to see some really great examples of, of people who have really mastered this craft, I can recommend, uh, and you will know some of these names, Kate Kennedy, uh, Ryan O'Neill, whose book The Weight of a Human Heart is absolutely a showcase of the many different ways that you can write a fantastic short story. He writes a whole short story, I think, without using the letter E, which is incredible. Um, Julie Coe's book Portable Curiosities. Laura Elvery, who I met through the Margaret River Press short story competition. We were on a panel together. She has a new collection coming out in August. Uh, Jennifer Down, who won the Elizabeth Jolly uh, Australian Book Review Award for her book Aoki Gahara a few years ago. It's the only short story that's ever made me cry in public. Um, so over time, I've gained this great respect for what short story writers in Australia are doing. And um, in gaining that appreciation as a reader, I got this great urge to, to be able to write like those people. So Short story writing for me, it started off as just something that I did for fun, something to hone my craft, something to build my writer's CV so that when I was pitching my novel to publishers, I could say I've been published in all these places and I've won X awards. And somewhere along the way, it became enjoyable in its own right. Um, so uh, even though I'd won the Catherine Susanna Pritchard Young Writers Award, which is the under 20s category, um, in 2011, I actually hadn't had much luck with short stories as an adult until about 2015. 2015 was sort of a turning point for me with my writing. Um, that was the year that I realised I could actually do this. I wasn't just something who enjoyed writing. I was somebody who was quite good at it or could, um, you know, could get my writing to a point where it could be put alongside some people who I thought were fantastic. So that was really good for the ego, as you can imagine. Um, that was the year that I was shortlisted for the John Marsden Award for Young Writers, which is delivered in partnership with Hachette Australia, one of the big five publishers in this country. Um, it's also the first time that I was published in one of the Margaret River Press anthologies, um, which begun my relationship with Margaret River Press and Caroline Wood, who is now my publisher, and also with Laurie Steed, who was my mentor through the process of writing Well Behaved Women. The story that I had published in um, that collection, the collection itself was called Shibboleth and Other Stories, but the story itself was called The Sea Also Waits. And you'll notice if you've scanned the contents list for my collection that I have a few titles that borrow title patterns slash steal title patterns from Hemingway novels. Um, I'm not a huge Hemingway fan, but I do like his titles. They're very evocative. So I've, I've stolen slash co-opted a few of those. <laughs> Um, and just prior to being in that collection, I'd also been published for the first time in the UK. That story was A Thousand Words, which is also in the book. I followed it up in 2016 with another good year. So I felt like, great, this is this is it. I'm getting momentum. I'm going places with this and, you know, all the hard work is paying off. Just as a as a warning, that always comes before <laughs> a bit of a disappointment. So. <laughs> In 2016, um, I was published for the second time by Margaret River Press in one of their anthologies in um, Joyner Bay and Other Stories, which Joyner Bay, the title story, was written by Laura Elvery, who I mentioned before. Um, and I was uh, highly commended in the Stuart Haddo Award administered by the Fellowship of Australian Writers in Swanbourne. So that was great. I felt like I was finally getting somewhere. 
And that was the year that the Australian Short Story Festival began. Um, the Australian Short Story Festival, for anyone who's not familiar with it, is a festival that is sort of the brainchild of um, Caroline Wood from Margaret River Press and also I think it's Anna Salting who is from um, Midnight Sun Publishing in Adelaide. So they, along with a panel of other great writers and short story lovers, put together this festival that runs once a year um, and it has been twice in Western Australia, once in Adelaide, and last year for the very first time it was um, uh, in Melbourne. So that was fantastic. Um, my Margaret River Press stable mate, Bindi Pritchard, got to go over to Melbourne and present at the festival and talk about her collection, Fabulous Lives. Um, I have this very clear memory uh, going to the second day of the festival, being on the train, going over the Narrows Bridge, and you know the sunlight was sort of coming through the window at this perfect angle. And I was thinking about whether or not I could ever publish a short story collection and what pieces I would put in if I did. And I, I decided, yes, I do have enough material. If I look back over all these years of writing short stories, I have enough pieces that I'm proud of that I would put together and there is a bit of a theme going. By this time, I was part of a fortnightly writing program that had started at the Fellowship of Australian Writers and then moved to the Centre of Stories, Centre for Stories, with one of my writer friends, Belinda, and the two of us were both honing our craft as short story writers, um, swapping and giving each other feedback. Um, so the Centre for Stories is also uh, run by Caroline Wood, who runs Margaret River Press. So I was developing a relationship with her and she mentioned that she was wanting to get some funding to foster some short story writers from WA through to having their own collections published. She wanted to know if I was interested. Was I interested? Yes, I was. <laughs> um, and she then asked me who I would like to be mentored by. I pretty much said Laurie Steed's name before she'd finished asking the question. Um, for anybody who's done one of his courses, Laurie has this fantastic reputation as being the short story writing teacher in WA, which is why it was really funny when his debut book came out last year and it was actually a novel. Um, but his story is sort of the opposite to mine in that he thought he was writing a short story collection and it turned out to be a novel. I thought I was going to get a novel published and I ended up with a short story collection. So there you go. We went through several rounds of applying for funding for this program that Caroline had um, dreamed up. There was three writers who she was wanting to work with and the third collection, um, which is called Sky Glow by Leslie Teal, that will be out in July, I believe. So do keep an eye out on the Margaret River Press website for that one. Um, we had to put together writing samples. I had to get um, established writers to write me a recommendation, which, you know, that's always very <laughs> nerve wracking, having to go up to people you admire and say, please, will you write a letter about how good you think I am? But we did it. We put together all of the bits that we needed. And in December 2018, I happened to check my email and I saw a very short email from Caroline telling me that we had got the funding, we'd been successful and that this would all be happening. But of course, I read it in a hurry, just saw we'd been successful with the funding and thought, oh, great, the mentorship program will be going on. So it wasn't until later that morning when I got a text message from my writer friend Louise Allen saying, I can't believe that you're going to be published and you knew this and you didn't tell me. And I had to find out from uh, an email newsletter. <laughs> And I said, what are you talking about? So I had to go back and reread the email and it did in fact say that we got the funding and so therefore they were going to be able to publish my book. Of course, that's when all the work actually starts is when they tell you that you're going to get your book published. Don't, don't be fooled into thinking that actually writing the book is the hard part. Laurie and Caroline and I met in January last year and we had a frankly terrifying meeting in which they told me how much work was going to have to be done and how short an amount of time I would have to do it. Um, we agreed to start actually working one-on-one -on -one with Laurie and I um, at the end of March after the Writers' Festival was out of the way and um, Laurie had finished up with some other clients. Um, and in the meantime, I was given a large sheath of notes to go through on my own. Uh, he gave me a 10 page editorial report which broke down each of the story's strengths and weaknesses. I gave him 
18 stories originally and then I added two more right at the beginning of the year, one that I'd been sitting on and one that I hadn't quite finished yet when I submitted the original uh, manuscript. One of those stories made it into the collection, one of them, the one that I finished in March was just never going to get there in time and I'm not really sure now why I sent it, but never know. Um, so he ranked all the stories in terms of various aspects. We had this little table where it was talking about the um, the style, the characterization, the plot, and he ranked them um, as far as uh, which ones needed a lot of work, which ones needed a moderate amount of work, and which ones needed very little work. And the ones that needed a lot of work, he warned me that we may not have the time to get them into shape and that they were in danger of being chopped out of the collection. So I got stuck into rewriting my stories based on these notes on my own. Um, and one of the stories, it was pretty clear right away that it needed to be cut because it didn't fit in with the theme that we were working on. It was too different. It was almost a um, crime thriller genre, whereas none of the other stories in the collection really have a genre aside from being contemporary. Um, and at this point, if the stories were not serving the theme of well-behaved women, then they did not have a place there. And that was probably one of the best pieces of advice that I was given was that every single piece has to be serving the theme and if it, if it doesn't, it doesn't belong. I felt much easier uh, about cutting that once it had actually been done. It was the decision itself that was hard. Um, there were also two more stories that were cut further on down the track, one of which had a very heavy emotional theme and needed to be reworked to serve the, um, you have a certain responsibility when you're working with with trauma, particularly if it's not your own trauma. And we we felt that we, we didn't quite get it over the line. So hopefully that one will be maybe in my next collection because I did work very hard on it, but <laughs> I agree that it didn't get over the line. Um, and the other one was the really recent one that I mentioned, which was about, um, it had a lot to do with Rocky Horror Picture Stories, if anybody's watched that. Um, that was a lot of fun to write, but it was in a very early draft stage, whereas everything else in the collection had been rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. And you could tell that there was no polish on that story, so that went. Um, but the what the other one that I sent in at the, the later stage, which is called Crying in Public, I sent to Laurie and he sent me back an email a day or so later that the, the subject line was just great effing story. So I think he really liked that one right off the bat. It had to go into the collection and I'm glad it's there because um, it was a really important story for me to write. And I hope that um, readers connect to it as much as I did when I was writing it. So I went through the stories one by one. I reread them, I rewrote them. I worked on one story at a time and didn't move on until I felt like I got each story right. Um, and uh, some of them I had to completely redo and pull apart. I'm gonna read a story to you later on called The Settlement. And this is one of the ones that I had to completely pull apart. Originally, the story was set in almost a 10 minute period in which a couple is driving along Caves Road in Margaret River side by side in a car during a rainstorm, picking over their relationship that has gone spectacularly wrong. And for a long time, Laurie and I were talking about why it just didn't feel like it was working. And eventually we worked out it was that time frame. There was too much emotional ground covered in 10 minutes for a reader to believe that they actually had gone through that emotional journey in such a short period of time. But I felt like the subject was really important. So I sort of picked it apart and tried a few different settings and it now takes place over some weeks in various scenes back and forth rather than all being in one go. So I think it works a lot better. I was really happy to be able to keep it in and explore that theme through the, the story. Laurie also got me to write something called log lines, which is where I had to distill each story down to a single sentence. And that was a really helpful exercise. So if anybody is putting together a short story collection, I would encourage you to do that as early as possible. Sometimes it's only when you sit down to write the log line that you realize that you have no idea what the story is about either. And it's really helpful to know that when you're revising them. So I had to hand the whole collection into Margaret River Press by the 1st of June. Um, Laurie and I went back and forth a little bit um, through email, but not on every story. Um, and eventually 
we got something that we were happy with and I think I handed it in to Caroline a few days early. If anybody knows me, I always hand in assignments a few days early and I'm always early to everything. So it's totally um, in character for me to do that. Uh, Caroline suggested a revised order for the stories. Um, I sort of had them almost in order of the ages of the characters and she suggested an order that is um, a lot more it makes a lot more sense from a publishing point of view, which is why she's the publisher and I'm the author. So we start with one of the really strong stories. We start with The Sea Also Waits, which was the first one that I had published in um, WA, and it ends with The Woman at the Writers' Festival, which at first I didn't agree with that, but um, since the book has been out, that seems to be the fan favourite. Everyone really likes The Woman at the Writers' Festival. Um, and I've read it aloud at a few events, and you, you really do see that the reaction. I think people relate to me letting my inner jealous writer out on the page. Um, I still feel really self-conscious about that story, um, but I'm coming to terms with the fact that people enjoy hearing me read it, so I'm just having to, to put that side of myself away. From there, the book was edited. Uh, the cover design was done by the fantastic Deborah Bilson, who has been shortlisted for an Australian Book Design Award for her work on the cover. So go Deborah, I hope she wins. Um, and my little flower face lady on there, I actually named her Edith. If you look really closely at the cover, you can see her eye peeking through the flowers, which makes it lovely and creepy. I quite, I quite enjoy that. Um, if you don't have a copy, my publisher has free shipping, so you can get one delivered to you if you're in isolation. Um, Margaret River Press is a really small team, so I was really blown away by how much effort this small team put into making this little book go. And I cannot thank Jay Anderson enough for all of the work that he put into making this book happen. He wrote my blurb, he organised all of my media, he organised all of the review copies to go out. He made me a little spreadsheet so I knew where I needed to be at what time. He does all the social media. Um, if Jay is watching or even if somebody watching knows Jay, thank you, Jay, you're an angel. Um, and I could not have done it without you. So far, the reaction to my little book has been very heartening. And many writers I admire have actually reached out to tell me that they liked the collection, which is really exciting. Um, someone said to me that short story collections rarely sell more than 300 copies in this country, so that was my goal, to sell 300 copies. It was a small one, but uh, I know for myself I have to be realistic with my goal setting, otherwise I end up quite disappointed. Um, I got to appear at the Writers Festival, I got to be in the post in the western suburbs, I got to be on ABC Radio, so there's all these little writerly dreams coming true along the way and now I get to be the very first author um, at Words with Wine Online so that's very exciting too. I'm actually now in the process of revising my next project which is a novel again and there is a bit of a South Perth connection because it's loosely based on the career of Mae Gibbs who lived in South Perth at one point in her life. Um, but I am also finding it a little bit difficult to switch between promoting this book and writing the other one. So that's a balance and a skill that I'm going to need to develop, I guess. Um, so I'll do a bit of a reading for you now before we go over to questions. We've got about five minutes that I can read in and I'm going to read, as I said, a story called The Settlement. Maybe just have a bit of wine to fortify myself. <laughs> Okay. Emily, before you start, mm. I'd like, just like to um, jump in there and say that your wine supplier will be very happy that you um, are drinking, in fact, some wine. Some wine. So there you go. Carry on. Lovely. <laughs> okay, so the settlement. I was 32 when we met and he was 39. We didn't have a lot in common. I was a desk clerk at the local library. He was the assistant regional manager of a bank, the kind of man who reads maybe one book a year and usually only on holiday. Dan Brown was his favourite author, followed closely by Jack Higgins, which should have told me all I needed to know. But Peter was the kind of charming man who people wanted to be friends with. He was friendly, outgoing, confident, and while I was married to him, I felt as if I'd had a bright light shone upon me. 
Sitting in the window seat at my favourite cafe, I thought about Peter as I thumbed through the weekend newspaper magazine, bringing my hot chocolate to my lips. Before our marriage, I'd been the kind of person who didn't care that much about how I looked. But under his guidance, I'd learned what colours I should and should not dye my hair, the cut and style that suited me best, what parts of my body I should wax, shave and sculpt and who to dress up for. I hadn't realised until I moved away from it all, until I'd had to start again with nothing, how unimportant those things were. Now, living a few hours out of the city, I dressed for comfort rather than style, wore my hair however took my fancy, and most importantly, had hours to myself to do the one thing that never failed to make me happy, read. They say that fate has a twisted sense of humour. As I put down the mug and reached for the second marshmallow, ready to pop it into my mouth, the door to the cafe opened, bringing a person inside in a flurry of wind and autumn leaves. A man. He was tall and dressed in jeans and a wool jumper, his head and ears obscured by a beanie. It was the way he walked that was most familiar to me. As the newcomer strode over to the counter, I gathered my book and my bag, and taking a last mouthful of my drink, I hurried out onto the street, heading in the direction of work. Though it was a Saturday, the library was busy, mostly with children and their parents, though, they were older, though there were older students working at the desks in the independent study room at the back of the building. Sonia Driscoll, the librarian on duty, was down in large print, encumbered by a trolley full of weighty hardback romances, her black rimmed glasses sliding halfway down her nose. Though she was younger than me, by about 10 years, she was the first friend I had made in the town and the only person who knew the whole sorry story about the collapse of my marriage. Jenny, she said, if you're going to get to work 45 minutes early, you should at least be bringing me coffee. I grabbed the handle on the opposite side of the trolley and leaned over it, prompting her to lean in too. I think I just saw Peter. She lowered her voice. Shithead Peter? I nodded. What's he doing here? I thought he got to keep the fancy house in Cottesloe. I know. When we sold the holiday home, he said he never wanted to come back to this sleepy town ever again. Sonia picked up a handful of Danielle Steele novels and shoved them roughly, roughly onto an overstuffed shelf. Maybe he's come to win you back. I rolled my eyes. Not likely. I think you've been reading too many of these. I pointed to the row of Mills and Boone she'd separated off to one side of the trolley. It could happen, she said. You're looking the best you've ever looked in your life. You're happy now. Maybe he's finally worked out that he's a shithead and he's come to beg you to take him back. Won't it be fantastic to tell him to get lost? I tried to laugh. I haven't heard from him in two years, Sonia, I said. Sonia shrugged. Stranger things have happened. That night I lay awake, going over the final death throes of our marriage. It would have been melodramatic to describe it as doomed from the start, but there had been certain signs that would have made life easier had I picked up on them earlier. A year into our marriage, Peter had been in line for a big promotion. To help his chances, we hosted a dinner party for a few of his co-workers and his boss, and I had cleaned the house in a frenzy, anxious to make the guests think that it always looked that way. The house was far bigger than two people really needed. We had two guest rooms that had never been slept in. I hid the dirty laundry in baskets under the counter, and in the second bathroom, I hid beer bottles in the recycling bin under a cereal box. I barely had enough time to wash my hair before the guests arrived. I had bought a new dress, searching for the one that would earn me a smile and a nod of approval. It was red, more of a burgundy really, and tight. It was ridiculous, I thought to myself as I struggled with the zip, the way a man's wife was considered a measure of how successful he was. What was even more ridiculous was that I constantly felt I was letting him down. Throughout dinner, the wives of his co-workers tried to make polite conversation, asking me about my job and where I went to university. I wish I had more time to read, lamented one of the wives when I told her I worked in the library. I'm in a book club, but I never get around to finishing any of the books. I used to read all the time when I was a teenager. I smiled into my glass of white wine, holding my tongue. Peter, patting my hand on top of the table, chimed in. I keep telling Jenny she should join a book club. She needs to get out of the house more. You'd be very welcome at ours, Jen. I'll Facebook you the next time there's a meeting. That's kind of you, I said. I don't know if I'd have the time, though. Sensing a pause in the conversation, Peter clinked his knife against his glass and stood. 
If I could just take this moment to say how honoured I am to have you all in my home this evening and to have this opportunity to introduce you all to my lovely wife. I hope that we have many more opportunities like this in the months to come. He raised his glass in the direction of his boss. Thank you, Peter, said Mr Wilson, raising his own glass, though not half as enthusiastically as Peter had done. And thank you, Jenny, for this interesting meal. I fixed my eyes on my plate to avoid looking at Peter. It was true. The meal had not gone according to plan. I'd been preparing a roast beef dish, but at the last minute, the word had come in that the bank manager's wife didn't eat red meat, and so I'd switched to making a curry at the last minute. Perhaps I'd added too much chilli. The guests had been refilling their water glasses all through the main course. Jenny tries her best, Peter said finally, smiling at me as if all of this were endearing. But, well, this dinner speaks for itself, doesn't it? It's a good thing she's pretty. I said nothing because they were his friends and colleagues. And to some degree, I believed that what he was saying was true. And I will leave it there. All right, so hopefully people have been asking questions because that's about all I've prepared for this evening. Um, Tamara is gonna be able to read the questions out for me, I hope. So I'll throw it over to you, Tamara, if you're ready. Yes, I am. You finished that story as I was enjoying a last bite of cheese and I was hoping that you might just continue for a minute mo more <laughs> but I didn't have to choke on it. But here we are. So thank you everybody who have sent in your questions. There are um, a couple around the writing process and there are a few around specific stories and probably let's start with because this word has come up in a number of questions about the ambiguous nature of some of your stories. Uh, for example, did you have a fate in mind for Katrina or was, did you deliberately leave that to be ambiguous? Um, and others had asked a similar question um, about how some of the stories ended beautifully suspended. I think that's a lovely term. That question came from Josephine, that the stories were beautifully suspended. And she was wondering if you knew what happens next or what really happened in the story, or did you intend to leave us suspended? So it's probably very telling that one of my favourite books is Joan Lindsay's Picnic at Hanging Rock, um, which you never really find out what happens. And I'm fascinated by uh, books that fall into that Australian Gothic genre. Uh, as far as Katerina goes, my free diver, I think I sort of hint at a magical realist ending for her, but we really know there's only one logical answer for what happened and that's quite sad. So it's much happier for us to believe that she has turned into a fish and swum away into the ocean. Um, yes, I, I do get asked about the ambiguous nature of the ending of my stories a lot. And in fact, at one of my very first writer's talks, I got into a bit of a back and forth with a man in the audience who wanted to know when the second half of one of the stories he would really enjoys enjoyed was going to be written and published. And I had to tell him that, no, I, I wasn't going to write the other half of that story, which was a movable farce, the one that's set in Paris. Um, I really like what happens to a short story when you don't tie everything up. If you've made the world real enough and you've made the characters live enough in your readers' minds, they'll often have made up their own minds about what they think has happened after the last sentence. So um, I like to deliberately leave them ambiguous. I like to see what effect happens when I do that. And it, sometimes it can be quite tricky to know when to end it. Some of these stories, I actually had to chop a few paragraphs off the end because I had over explained it. And I know some of my readers find that very frustrating. That's terrific. Um, really interesting um, when stories don't tie up neatly. Um, seems to me that often uh, writers and publishers um, encourage the stories to be tied up, you know, every, all the loose ends are dealt with. So it's really refreshing from um, to see a writer not do that um, and quite, quite fun too. 
Mm, well, readers so, aren't stupid, so you have to give them credit. And and life's not like that. You never really get all the answers, and sometimes you just don't have enough information even to guess. So I like my stories to mimic that a bit. Great. So I've got a question here from Karen, who's asked about where you source your ideas. And before we went live, you were telling me that actually you've been writing these stories for over 10 years? Yes. So how, how do you get your ideas? Where do they come from? All sorts of places. Um, I realised only after I had started to revise this collection that a lot of the stories are inspired by things that make me deeply anxious. So um, there's a story in here that was inspired by the increased coverage from the end of 2016 of the um, Claremont serial killer trial um, when they, they caught the accused and it was back in the news again that really dredged up for me some of that anxiety because the coverage of those girls disappearing was on the news every night when I was a child and I, I believe that you know my generation has this real call me when you get home and stick together and it's dangerous for girls to go out night clubbing in short skirts in you know on their own because there's the shadow of those girls going going missing so I've written a story about a character who feels like it was you know there but for the grace of God it could have been her um, and that story is from Under the Ground. That was published in Westerly originally and now appears in a slightly moderate, um, modified version in the book. Um, I was also inspired by news articles that I read. So um, The Sea Also Waits was inspired by the real life disappearance of Natalia Molchanova, who was one of the world's best freedivers. She would go out regularly and tie weights around herself and, you know, dive down to the deepest parts of the ocean just simply holding her breath and then went out one day just for a practice dive and didn't come up and they they theorised that she might have been caught in a rip or something like that and couldn't find her way back to the surface. But I don't believe that they've ever found a body. So there's a little bit of, you know, the mystical there that the reason she could dive so deeply was because she was at one with the sea anyway, and the sea's been waiting to reclaim her all that time. That was what I wanted to go for there. But I was inspired by the interview that they did with her son, who was also a freediver. They had this shared sort of affinity around this thing that they were so passionate about. And the way he spoke about his mother and about freediving, he wasn't choked up with grief. He had this sense of acceptance that he always knew this was going to be how he would lose his mother. Um, that it just sparked something off in me. And I think that story is the only time I've ever been able to do this, but I went home and I wrote it in one go and I've not really had to revise it much at all um, into its published form. So that one, I felt like I was channeling a little bit. It was kind of spooky. And I, you know, I, I now live my writing life, hoping that that will happen again, because it's the easiest it's ever been. Some days it's like pulling teeth. Um, some things are inspired by my own life and then I'll take them, you know, 10 or 11 degrees away from where they started or I'll take something from my life and something from something I've read and something from the news article and just combine it all together. Um, that's the, the wonderful thing about short stories is that you can travel all sorts of different places in the one book. Tamara, your microphone's off again. Thank you. <laughs> great. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, which it kind of leads in to this question um, from Leslie, which is, do you find short story, the form of short story writing more constraining than writing novels? And she says, P.S. She loves the collection. Oh, thank you, Leslie. Um, absolutely. Writing short stories is much, much harder than writing novels. That being said, I have not published a novel, so maybe at some point the balance will shift and I will change my answer. It depends on how much longer it takes me to get a novel published. But when you're writing a short story, there's a couple of things to take into account. The first is that most people who are going to be reading short stories, they either write short stories or they have some other interest in literature. It's not a genre that gets picked up by your average reader who goes to buy books um, at, you know, the, the, at Kmart or Target or um, you know, ends up in the bestsellers list at Dimmix and things like that. It's, it's a very um, specialised genre that, as I said, you, know, you may only sell 300 copies in the whole lifetime of your book. So those people, first of all, 
know how writing works and are going to be paying really close attention. The other thing is that you only have a really short space of time to work in, so you cannot waste a single word. And like when I was doing that reading, I found several errors that if I was a reader, I would have gone, oh my goodness, you cannot get away with this. I think I said at the last minute twice in one sentence. So, you know, if only I could go back and edit the, the story again, because I know that readers are going to be picking up on stuff like that a lot easier than they would if they were just in the flow of a novel. Um, obviously, writing a novel is going to be a much bigger time constraint as far as from start to finish. Writing a short story often will only take me about a day to write the first draft because I have to sit down and write it all in one go. If I w write a scene and then walk away and come back to it, in a short story that drive is gone and I just can't finish the story at all whereas with a novel I'll write a chapter and then I will sometimes not come back to it for a month I have I have been known to do that recently not come back to my my book for more than a month um, but with a short story it has to be done all in one go so they, they're very different forms um, I would definitely say that short stories are much harder though <laughs> okay I have got uh, a number of people have asked questions about your writing process yeah. and we've got uh, limited time left we really need to um, end the event um, latest uh, in about seven minutes oh. so just to give you a, a sort of a timeline um, it, for the, um, so Malcolm your fur neighbor has asked um, about which was there a story that you left out or a piece of yourself that you would like to have seen um, in in the book reflected in some of the stories and somehow it got left out there's yeah. that question um I'll, and i'll and i'll just skip to a couple of others just so that you know yeah. you know how much time you've got um people have asked um about um have you thought about jennifer has asked had you thought of visiting schools to talk to students because she thinks that your explanation of the writing process was wonderful um and there have been some questions about uh courses from janine has asked are there any courses in wa that you would recommend how to hone the craft of writing and in particular how to write stories so i'll leave you with those three sure. any any other questions that are there um i will put them to emily and um we'll be able to send you an answer um after the event so if you've missed out thank you very much and um and but you will get um an answer a couple of them are quite technical um and i think you know would be better perhaps answered one on one um yeah uh, the only other one that i would add to that just quickly is your writing habits or rituals around writing that you might like to sh that you'd be happy to share with us okay so lovely Thanks, Emily. Um, I've written some notes about those ones down, so hopefully I won't forget anything. But um, yeah, and if anybody wants to ask me a question that they haven't thought of yet, they think of something later, come and find me on one of the many social media platforms that I'm on all the time and just ask me there. I'm very happy to answer your questions there. Um, so as far as a story or a piece of myself that got left out, yeah, there was a story, the Rocky Horror Picture Show one that I was talking about. I really want to get that right, but it's a very hard one to write about. It was about um, a time in my life during high school where uh, I had a very uh, problematic relationship with another girl where it was sort of that love-hate relationship. Um, she's my best friend, but also my worst enemy and made me the most miserable in my life. And I, I have wanted to explore that in fiction probably since I read Eleanor Ferrante's Neapolitan Quartet and I realised just how well um, women's relationships with each other could be done in fiction. I have been trying since I read that book and that's probably going on six or seven years now. So maybe one day I'll get that right. Um, Jennifer, I would love to come and talk at schools. If you work in a school and you want me to come and talk at your school, do contact me. I would love to do that. Um, Nobody has asked me yet, but I, you know, I went to Applecross High School. So if anybody knows anybody at Applecross, I'd love to go and talk at my old school. That would be really fun. Uh, as far as courses go, I've done most of my writing training through university. So I did my um, Bachelor of Arts in Creative Arts and History through Murdoch as an undergrad. 
and then I did my graduate diploma in professional writing and publishing online through Deakin University. But do check out um, the local writers centres. Um, we have lots of fantastic writers centres in WA and in particular I'm going to give a shout out to the Centre for Stories who regularly run writing workshops with amazing local writers like Amanda Curtin and Susan Medaglia. Um, and I think they're doing a lot of their events online as much as they can. They also have a really inclusive program, so they're trying to get a lot more diverse voices into our writing scene, which is fantastic to see. And also the Catherine Susanna Pritchard Writers' Centre, which is located in Greenmount. They gave me the residency back in 2014, which really helped get me started. Um, my writing habits, mm, bad habits at the moment, but I do, I keep a journal and I write in that as much as possible. Um, and I used to write at night after 8.30, but now um, I get up really early every day. So I am part of a group called the 5am Writers Group. We never write at 5am, it's a false name, but we do try to get up early and write in the morning. And I know a few of them have been writing at 6am every day this week. So one of these days I'm going to get up at 6am too and <laughs> work with them. So here's hoping tomorrow after all this wine, I'm able to get up nice and early. I think I covered them all. <laughs> Well done, Emily. That was um, some speed answers there, and I'm sure people really appreciated that you that you got that in. And I'll just reiterate for anybody who hasn't had their question answers, we'll do our best to get um, those answers to you. But if we don't, um, in the email that was sent to you with the feedback um, survey, there was also a link to Emily's um, blog page, her web page, and you can contact her through there. And also, as I said, Margaret River Press, uh, if you'd like to get yourself a copy of the book with no shipping fees, that's that's terrific. So what I'm going to do now is I'd like to sort of wind up and, and say thank you. So give us a wave, Emily. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. And, um, and I'd just like to say a big thank you to Emily for her excellent talk tonight. I think she shared with us an awful lot of information and personal insight in quite a small amount of time, really. I'd also like to thank her for her patience and cooperation while we all got comfortable with the technology that is making this live online event possible. And uh, we had quite a few practices I'd also like to take an opportunity to thank my colleagues here at the City of South Perth, especially um, the information technology team who have just been there to help and support us and make this work. And also, of course, the library services team, um, my team. And um, we've just had so much fun putting this together for you. And I hope that you really have um, enjoyed it. And you will also let us know your thoughts by completing that survey. Have you got the message that we need you to fill out the survey? If you'd like us to do more events like this, that feedback that we get really helps us um, to know what you want and to make sure that we are doing things in a way that is working for everyone. So lastly, um, upcoming events, we've got a few in the pipeline, some more live events now that we've completed this one. And so if you'd like to know about those, the way to do that is to sign up for the City of South Perth um, e-snapshot newsletter and you can do that from the City of South Perth website and also you can follow the City of South Perth uh, Facebook page where they will announce when we have new events coming up. So don't miss out on anything coming up and with that we'd just like to say you know cheers, good night, the mice have finished the cheese. Hope everybody enjoyed themselves tonight and uh, happy reading.